Power Politics and the Politics of Power. This time on the show, I'll talk with New York City's chief resilience officer about the decision of the city to divest from oil and gas, and Clara Vondrich of Divest Invest, one of the groups that helped make it happen. All that and author and journalist Christian Parenti explains why he thinks we don't demand enough of government and the state but how climate crisis demands that we rethink. That's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Two thousand eighteen kicked off with New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio announcing two big moves on climate change. New York City, he declared, is suing some of the world's most powerful oil companies for having, quote, intentionally misled the public to protect their profits. New York's also divesting city pension funds from fossil fuels. De Blasio is clearly at odds with the president, who has claimed that climate change is a, quote, concept created by and for the Chinese. Also, the EPA administrator, who seems to be hell-bent on dismantling his own agency. And the Secretary of the Interior, who is busily selling off public land for fracking and drilling. But New York City is not actually alone. In the wake of the U.S.'s withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement, U.S. cities have stepped up to tell the world we are still in. In fact, that's the name of their campaign. So far, mayors from close to 400 U.S. cities have pledged to adopt the Paris Climate Agreement goals. And it's not just them. Governors, CEOs of major companies, and some universities have all pledged to uphold and in some cases surpass the U.S. commitment. So what does it all add up to? Can cities really roll back global warming or stop the water's rise? And specifically for this program, how do moves like de Blasio's come about? What people power goes into making those changes? Clara Vondrich is with Divest Invest, a global network devoted to exactly what you'd think, divesting from fossil fuels while investing in sustainable energy and climate solutions. And Daniel Zarilli is the Senior Director of Climate Policy and Programs, as well as Chief Resilience Officer for New York City's Mayor's Office. He was with de Blasio at the historic announcement and is a key figure in implementing New York's climate programs. Chief Resilience Officer, that must feel pretty good. Does it? It's a fun title. It's really about preparing New York City for the future and the, the challenges we face. And climate change is one of the top challenges that we certainly face with rising seas. Uh, we lived it with Hurricane Sandy and saw the impacts of what a changing climate is going to mean here in New York City. And that's why we're taking bold action. Talk about the announcement and really what was in it. Did I get it more or less right? What, what are the details? No, that's absolutely right. We're taking the fight straight to the fossil fuel companies. We are deciding, we are working uh, to divest our pension funds of fossil fuel reserve companies. Uh, we know that these are uh, losing assets. Uh, they've underperformed for years. They have a poor outlook for, uh, for the future. And we want to make sure we're protecting our pensioners and the, the pensions they rely on uh, from those risks. At the same time, we saw with Hurricane Sandy um, clear damages from a changing climate. We know that the storm was sitting on top of sea level rise that's already happened. We know those impacts are going to get worse in the future, and we need to protect ourselves. We're investing $20 billion right now already in, uh, in climate resiliency, and we know we're going to need to do more. And we need the, the folks who caused that damage to step up and help us pay for the protections we need. How much money are we talking about at the level of the New York City pension funds? Uh, so we have about $190 billion in the, in the funds, and about $5 billion is invested in fossil fuel reserve companies across the five pensions that we manage. So five billion can make a big difference. Talk a bit about what went into this at the movement level, and then I'll, I'll see what Dan thinks about what you said. Absolutely. <laughs> I think a little bit of history is really important here. So this movement really rose out of the collective disappointment of Copenhagen and the Waxman-Markey bills back around 2009, 2010. The climate movement had poured billions of dollars into these two top-down solutions, and they failed. So there was a grassroots uprising. Um, students um, started this campaign. Students 
on U.S. college campuses were the ones that lit the spark, and this was in about 2011 on the Swarthmore uh, campus. Yes, I remember that we covered it on this right, program. Swarthmore Mountain days. Justice. Kate Aronoff and, um, and her colleague Will uh, started this movement, and it was also done in concert with some, some really bold philanthropists like Ellen Dorsey at the Wallace Global Fund, who helped strategize with the students and really got the first coal divestment and fossil fuel campaigns going. And then, of course, Bill McKibben wrote his groundbreaking article in Rolling Stone, Global Warming's Terrifying New Math, which um, laid out the carbon tracker analysis, which said four-fifths of all fossil fuels have got to stay in the ground. And it follows that the stocks of those fossil fuel companies are overvalued. Because they value all of those resources they can't They're on their books. Exploit. They're on their books. And so when investors realize this and when policies are enacted and market forces are such that, you know, clean energy is starting to win, that bubble will burst and investors will lose their shirts. All right. So is that what happened inside the mind of New York City mayoral politics? You see the numbers and the people and the Failure at Copenhagen and... Well, well certainly, we, we've been uh, participating and, and following along with the global conversation, and we've adopted the Paris Agreement here locally. Uh, a, a lot of credit to the activists and folks who kept this high on the radar and kept pushing uh, for, for uh, big, bold solutions. And at the same time, we're dramatically cutting our greenhouse gas emissions and adapting and investing in resilience. We needed to send a message and, and react to the knowledge that fossil fuel stocks are underperforming, and we need to protect our pensions and also deal with the damages that were caused by a decades-long campaign of deception and denial by fossil fuel companies and take the fight straight to them because we need to protect New Yorkers. Now, be honest, Bill de Blasio is not listening. Mm -hmm. um, but he Nobody is. is. <laughs> um, would this have happened without Donald Trump? I mean, isn't there also a, a piece of the agenda which is a proud progressive city mayor wanting to stand up against the big bad president? So that may fit a lot of the, the, the model of, of needing to protect New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. um, these actions are not political by any means. These actions are protecting New Yorkers and the financial interests of our pensions, of our communities, and making sure that we are uh, doing right by New Yorkers. Um, what I think we've seen in this, in this Trump era is the need to take more direct action because we can't rely on the federal government to solve our climate crisis. Mm -hmm. um, you already referenced the we are still in campaign, the climate mayors. All of that is reason for hope that we're coming together and we can fulfill America's pledge to the Paris Agreement by acting together across multiple sectors, cities, states, governors, businesses, mm -hmm. um, and universities. And I, I, there's a lot of hope in that, that we can come together. And I think the math is on our side and uh, the thing that we don't have on our side is time, and yeah. we need to move as quickly mm -hmm. as we can. Indeed, I would just add that um, the beauty of the Divest Invest movement is that it doesn't depend on who's in power. It doesn't depend on what policies are enacted or in place. It's it's an uprising of the people, of investors, and they're able to say that they can move with their their money. They right. can move. They can vote with their pocketbooks. And what started really as an ethical call has now morphed into one that sits on three three legs of a stool. Really ethical financial and fiduciary duty or legal. So at first it was just a moral call to action. Then, as Dan pointed out, the fossil fuel stocks have really started to underperform. And um, they're actually the worst performing sector of the S&P six years running on average. And um, in addition, most of the pension fund trustees and others we would approach in the course of this campaign would tell us, we get your point, we get the ethics, but it's against our fiduciary duty to divest. Mm -hmm. That now is flipping as well as folks like the TCFD, Bloomberg and Carney's task force on climate-related financial disclosures have said that it's your fiduciary duty to, 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 well, to consider climate risk, and divestment is one way of managing that risk. Now, the second part of your organization's name is Invest. Yes. Um, where's the money going to go? What are you going to invest in? Our pension funds, et cetera. Well, so we're, we're taking a, a multiple-step approach to this, um, but we need to get our money out of fossil fuels, and we're taking the steps to do that. Um, and we're going to ultimately end up with a portfolio that just doesn't have our money in fossil fuels. We're also doing some work to understand what it might mean to invest in clean energy and climate solutions. Um, there's more of that analysis that's ongoing that's going to help us figure that out. There are some very specific plans. We had um, a, a lot of people on this program who have advocated for wind power mm -hmm. and um, solar, understand there's going to be a wind farm or at least a few windmills off Long Island if the <laughs> governor has his way. What's on the horizon, do you think, on that level? Oh, I think um, we need to build an offshore wind industry here in the United States. It, it, it's, it barely exists, and that's going to take some effort. It's going to take uh, somebody going first to make that happen. Mm -hmm. But we've also al already seen other action. We've quintupled the amount of solar in New York City alone. 
Um, we're continuing to ramp up our renewable power, solar and wind. We're, we're working to set targets for uh, better battery storage to take advantage of those renewables. There's a lot of action and we want to make sure we're investing not in the, in the fuels of the past, but we're looking forward and investing in the fuels of the future. Public ownership, maybe? <laughs> Well, I think um, we have plenty of work we're doing on public buildings. We're leading by example. We've got a thousand electric vehicles in our fleet. Um, I think a lot of things are on the table. That's a really important point. Go for it. And in the Divest Invest platform, and something that our members commit to is this idea of investing in a just clean energy transition, what one that's that fair and equitable, and that really serves to lift up the most underprivileged, most vulnerable communities. It's not. We can't recreate the same power monopolies of the past if we just go from fossil fuel Bahamas to solar and wind Bahamas, we're in trouble because it's going to leave a lot of people behind. We want local ownership. We want community-based investment. We want to make sure that you know the folks that have borne the brunt of this madness are really lifted up and given a voice at the table. I mean, there's a real question. It's like we've historically called for better regulation of the too big to fail X, banks, right. corporations, whatever. Um, there is this agenda. What about breaking them actually up? Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in this utility question, though. Um, Boulder recently had a voter initiative, a ballot initiative, that was at the end of a lot of time of trying to get the local privately owned utility mm -hmm. to transition to renewables. They weren't doing it, they weren't doing it, and finally the, the people of that part of Colorado said, you know what, we're going to take over the company and we'll do it. And now they have a municipally owned, or they're on their way to having a municipally owned um, power company, which I think is an interesting model. It's the future. What about the relationship with the state in New York, meaning New York State? Mm -hmm. The numbers there are truly huge, 200 billion, I think, at the level of the pension funds. That really could make a huge difference I to the it, global economy. I think it is making a huge difference. And the, the state is already taking steps on its divestment portfolio. Um, we're certainly taking those steps in New York City. And, and you add those two up, and it's almost $400 billion of, of assets um, that are going to be divesting. That sends a huge market signal from the, the global capital of finance um, to be making these statements that we know that we need to invest in the future and that the fossil fuel stocks are ultimately underperforming. And it is a fiduciary duty to make sure we're protecting our pensions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that's, that means, and that's why we're taking these actions we're yeah. taking. And can, I mean, clearly cities and states are doing it at the local level. Mm -hmm. Global climate change, though, still feels like something that always goes way beyond a city boundary or the mm -hmm. ability of a city to have an impact on. Well, it's, I think that's absolutely true, is that, you know, when we talk about greenhouse gases and it can feel like an esoteric thing that's far away or that you can't see and touch. But um, what's more important is understanding how climate change is impacting people. And mm -hmm. if it's your child getting asthma, if it's impacting your ability to get a, a good job, if, it's, if your house is flooding on a more regular basis, those sort of um, personal impacts I think we're going to continue to change the dynamic around climate change because it's, it's not something happening far away to someone else. It's here and it's now. And we've learned those lessons and we need to act faster. And at the end I think, of the day, doesn't it have to be kind of global agreements, global level governance? Look, I think the power of iconic leaders like New York City can't be understated or overstated. When we announced that the Rockefeller Brothers Fund was divesting from fossil fuels, the very family that was the heir to John D. Rockefeller, Standard Oil, which of course became Exxon. That sent a shockwave around the world. And so iconic commitments like that of the Rockefellers, that of New York City, that of the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, these are powerful signals that I think will help to get those governments ultimately on board because it gives them cover. It gives them comfort that there are big institutional investors behind them seeking the kind of changes that we've tasked them to do as, as the people. Now, just before we close, we've only got a few more minutes, but I'm interested really in how this inside-outside work <laughs> happens. And I want you to be as helpful as possible. Um, you say that, you know, these changes were happening and that helped us, like gave us sort of extra oomph and, and new data came out. But surely there were also actual conversations, meetings, connections between people in the administration and people outside. What works in terms of communicating with our, our city officials as people with an agenda we're trying to push. Well, I think, and you can tell this story as well, persistence helps and facts matter. And mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, ultimately it may be hard to get over the hump and make a big, bold decision, um, but that's what we're here to do. And that persistence helped us get there and the facts were on our side. And so it, um, what culminated on January 10th of the announcements we made 
um, came out of that work that we did together and the persistence that came out of the activist community, and we thank them for it. How long do you think that timeline was, really? Well, you've been. I can tell you. For, yeah, yeah, it's been a five-year campaign. I remember um, 350 NYC, the local affiliate of 350 National, both of which are incredible allies in this fight. We um, delivered 11,000 petitions to Controller Na DiNapoli back in March of 2014, and of course, the year before was spent organizing. So it's been a five-year campaign, and it's been with persistent protests, rallies, delivering petitions, actual meetings with city officials. Tish James, public advocate, has been an unbelievable ally who hosted a divestment seminar last September that I think really helped to put it on the mayor's radar screen a little bit more. Um, we actually worked with Bill Lipton at the Working Families Group to petition the mayor to actually join us at our annual press conference back in 2016. And so there's been so much organizing, both on a sort of public protest level, but also you know, helping share the information that might be helpful to um, the, the decision makers. And is there something that really doesn't help? Nobody got egged in this process, but is there mm -hmm. something that activist groups need to know about what makes things difficult or harder well, I, I, people trying to make I think the the point of, No, no, I think the point of facts matter, um, yeah. you know, and so overstating the case doesn't help, and mm -hmm. that's certainly not what, what this is about, but mm -hmm. that can happen in other campaigns. Um, but it's, it's really important to stay grounded in the facts, to push us beyond what um, maybe we think initially is uh, politically possible, um, and to be persistent. So we should now come to you with a list of things to invest in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we're always interested in uh, looking <laughs> to the future. <laughs> what do you do next? Where does this campaign and this relationship go next? So we've actually been doing a little bit of talking. Um, I think it's vital for Bill de Blasio to exercise his leadership now to recruit other mayors around the country to divest. And we have this big Jerry Brown uh, Global Climate Action Summit happening in September. And so we have an annual press conference where we announce uh, the total tallies of monies divested as well as iconic new commitments. And we'll be doing that again right on the eve of the Jerry Brown Summit. And we're hoping that with the mayor and Dan's help, we'll have a host of new cities to announce. We should say the, the companies that you're suing say this won't make any difference and it's ineffective and they, they dismiss the suits. Um, what do you think is the likelihood they'll actually go to court? And oh, well, we feel like the, the, the merit of the merits of the case stand on their own and we feel very confident that we've got solid legal grounding and we're going to pursue this as far as we can. Um, that being said, I think to, to, the, to the point of others taking action. It's really important. And we've seen this groundswell of support come from across the country. And we've seen city councils um, issue resolutions in support. We saw this in LA. We saw it in Cambridge. Other cities are, are telling us, we support what New York City is doing. And they're trying to find ways to do it in their own towns, their own cities, their own states. And I think we're, you know, when you talk about tipping points and um, the power of New York City acting, mm -hmm. we're going to see a lot more of this mm -hmm. coming. Mm -hmm. So a uh, uh, tip of the hat to those activists on campuses that were doing this years oh, ago. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Is the campus movement still continuing? The campus moving, movement is still continuing. Um, we have especially seen a proliferation in the UK, Australia, and Europe. Um, this this movement has just grown from you know, a really parochial US-based movement to one that's truly global. We have over 800 commitments by institutional investors who collectively manage six trillion in assets. So it's a big deal. And I just have to give a shout out to 350 NYC, 350 Brooklyn, Green Faith, 350 National, um, all the unbelievable oh, communities uh, for change in New York, uh, all the amazing folks that came together to make this happen. It wouldn't have been possible without the, the, the coalition aspect. It's not one person, it's not one group. This is a leader full movement and it takes all of us. How to keep your coalition together. Make sure to mention them when you're on TV. <laughs> Thank you both. It's great talking Thanks to you. Thanks so much for having us. Extreme weather, record-breaking temperatures, and ever more devastating hurricanes will require us to demand more of the state. And it's about time, says Christian Parenti. Parenti is associate professor of economics at John Jay College. His books include Tropic of Chaos, Climate Change, and the New Geography of Violence. I sat down with him this fall in his neighborhood in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, to talk about the risks and opportunities inherent in this moment. Take a look. We're in uh, Monsignor McGoldrick Park in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. We're not far from the site where oil refining began in America. We're at the edge of one of the largest oil spills in American history, which is an underground oil spill. 
It's traditionally, traditionally a working class Polish neighborhood that is slowly but surely gentrifying as much of New York gentrifies. Probably one of the early manifestations of the climate crisis will be a new urban crisis in which due to rising sea levels and intensified storms there will be more inundations of urban infrastructure and with those inundations are rotting out of that infrastructure and capital and population will start leaving the coastal cities and when that happens the value of these properties declines the tax base declines it will make it that much harder for municipal governments to defend cities with seawalls or by retreating from certain coastal areas to, to build bio shields. You know, there was a very serious urban crisis in New York City in the 1970s, which was population decline, uh, abandonment of buildings, disinvestment. We could easily see that pattern return to a place like Greenpoint, Brooklyn, if there aren't proper adaptive measures taken by the government. But we could also see this city as a model of, of appropriate design. And right now we're in a moment of sort of maybe peak denial where everyone is hostage to these property values and even mayors who might want to plan for these sorts of events realize that they can't articulate too explicitly or aggressively the fact that the cities are, are threatened by sea level rises without possibly triggering uh, a lack of confidence or a collapse of confidence in property values and they need those property values to be high to have the taxes to build sea walls to retreat from the sea etc etc with climate change the state is coming back and the question is only what form of state will that be is it going to be a repressive racist police state that tries to keep a lid on the the new sacrifice zones of the molding once inundated cities or is it going to be a more progressive version of the state we could hopefully with enough pressure with the appropriate kinds of political movements we could use these crises to really kind of reclaim the state and turn it into a more progressive force in society by helping to decommodify housing decommodify health care decommodify education all in the name of protecting society and protecting the most vulnerable and operating collectively and that's going to have to require that sort of uh, you know, socialization of the costs of reproduction is going to require redistribution. The elites are going to have to pay more than they currently do. And in many ways that would be a good thing for the economy at large because part of the problem we have in capitalism right now is the problem of overaccumulation. There's simply too much money and not enough profitable outlets for it to be invested in. Thus you get one financial bubble after another. Capitalism is continually dependent on subsidies and guidance from the state. And what we need to do is become aware of this and then move it in the right direction. And what really needs to be done is for the state to take much of this liquidity that's sloshing around the international financial system, take it through taxes and invest it in uh, public infrastructure, in adapting to climate change at the, the scale of cities on, on coastlines and also invest in the project of mitigation, getting off of fossil fuels by, uh, you know, building out clean energy, et cetera, et cetera. When uh, Superstorm Irene flooded Vermont, there was a really interesting combination of local volunteer action coalescing around town government connecting with the state government and with the federal government to bring in aid to help rebuild the infrastructure. In the United States, we have more than enough money. The private sector is sitting on more uninvested cash than at any time since the Federal Reserve kept these records starting in 1956. It's over $2 trillion. This is money firms are waiting to invest, not to give to their stockholders, but like we're looking for the next big thing. We have all the technology, right? We've got uh, wind and solar power, we have an electrical grid, we have electric vehicles. Not only these things have to be invented, they have to be brought to scale. And the government has uh, enormous amounts of money, as I said, the, the, the role of the big green buy, government purchasing. And we also have the laws in that the, the, the Clean Air Act of 1970 was modified by a lawsuit that in 2007 the Supreme Court said that the EPA must regulate greenhouse gas emissions. That's important because it means we don't actually have to pass new legislation through this 
rather extremely right-wing Congress that we have, what we need to do is be pressuring the government to follow the law and start imposing fines under the Clean Air Act on fossil fuel emitters. And if fines were imposed on fossil fuel emitters, it would mean that the cost of fossil fuel energy would go up and relative to the, to the cost of renewable energy, those would go down and that would, in that alone would f start forcing investment into building out a clean tech sector and you'd start having economies of scale in, um, in all manner of technology from you know, vehicle production to building retrofitting and it would really help drive the transition. Mm -hmm.